Uh, I'm Ruchi Anand, and this is the, uh, from IIT Bombay, and this is the part three of my uh, series of lectures that I'm giving, in which I show uh, you how important protein structure is. So in the first part, I told you what is uh, uh, the basis in which how protein structures are determined, uh, the X-ray crystallography, and you get electron density, and uh, uh, the process uh, in very brief. In the second part, I showed you what protein structure is and how protein structures are studied uh, uh, by looking at secondary tertiary structures and what are those secondary structures made up of, uh, what are the interactions, the hydrogen bonding interactions which hold them together, amino acid types and propensities of these amino acids. Now in the third part, uh, I will show you how protein structure, knowledge of the protein structure helps you um, uh, uh, get the reaction mechanism, which is the chemistry part. So it, if an enzyme catalyzes a reaction, then how does crystallography help us unearth it? There's more practical uh, uh, knowledge that we need to know uh, as to the application of uh, uh, once you know the protein structure, how it helps you know the reaction mechanism. So let me share my screen uh, and uh, give you an example. Okay. so. Uh, let me start. So here we have uh, what I'm going to talk about today, that we will use the knowledge that we have got from protein crystallography to uh, be able to understand function of an enzyme. So this enzyme that I've picked is called 2 prime deoxyribosyl transferases. The function of this enzyme is to shuffle bases. So uh, the enzyme is in its mon monomeric form, 18 kilo Dalton. And we have taken a lactobacilli enzyme. And uh, what it does is it can do a nucleoside uh, exchange or a purine exchange. Uh, NTD means all nucleosides. PTD means only purine uh, shuffling. So, uh, and we want to understand how this chemistry happens, how the stereochemistry is maintained that only beta anomer is formed. And uh, how we can use this uh, uh, chemistry to actually uh, synthesize uh, compounds uh, with anti-cancer and antiviral properties. So let me uh, uh, go ahead to remind you of the reaction a little bit more clearly. What this enzyme people propose does is that it ha there is a, uh, there is a uh, for example, we st st start with a sugar and a base, which is called, um, in this case, it is an adenosine because it's an NH2 at the sixth position. And this is deoxy, that means OH is there. Uh, uh, so it's 2 prime deoxy adenosine, and this is 2 prime uh, deoxy guanosine. So this is what uh, this particular uh, 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 enzyme uh, does is instead of adenosine leaves and guanosine enters. So it will shuffle bases. That is what its function is. And uh, you can have uh, uh, a shuffling of base, for example, NTD can shuffle any base, uh, uh, put a purine uh, to a pyrimidine, for example, uh, with an intermediate in which they believe that it uh, binds to the enzyme so that the next base can come in. So you can have uh, a pyrimidine come in or a purine come in in case of NTD. So there were many questions we wanted to ask uh, about this uh, thing. I'm going to cover most of them. That what is the reaction mechanism by which these uh, uh, happen and uh, how does uh, it do other uh, ribosylation and how does this uh, specificity happen? So for this, uh, to answer these questions via the crystallography route, first the crystals uh, of this protein was made and this is what has been described, the crystallization condition, which was a salt and a buffer based condition at pH 8.5. Uh, and because we collect the data at uh, liquid nitrogen temperatures so that the crystal does not go through damage. Uh, so therefore, uh, what uh, happens is there is uh, um, cryoprotection done on the crystal and that's why they use glycerol so that ice does not form. So in the beginning, we get this crystal and uh, uh, its uh, shape is tetragonal bipyramid and it is a tetragonal uh, crystal with a P4 symmetry of the crystal is defined and it has uh, got a lot of solvent uh, molecules in it, uh, solvent content 53% because uh, protein crystals have a lot of solvent in it. So uh, this data was grown, then uh, data was collected as synchrotron and then it was uh, processed and uh, ultimately uh, by, uh, by uh, methods which I was telling you, you get the structure factor and the phases and you get electron density uh, and the model is then refined. 
So I will show you the uh, that this is the uh, electron density. Uh, sorry, it's the diffraction pattern. And from this diffraction pattern, you only take the intensities and get the structure factor. And from there, uh, you have to do go on to then solve the structure. This is what the uh, electron density looks like. And we fit amino acids like I showed you in the last uh, presentation. This is a lysine. This is a tyrosine and isoleucine, phenylalanine, and so on. The whole protein structure is kind of built. So you can see each an amino acid, uh, each amino acid has its own side chain, and you can see clearly, and you can see the amide bond also very clearly. So from here, uh, from the electron density, we are able to make a model of the protein. Uh, so we are able to tell the protein structure. But uh, like I told you in my previous uh, presentation, for easier view, we stick with this. Uh, kind of representation where we, we show the overall secondary structure in the form of cartoon. This particular protein is a hexamer, a trimer, glue of a trimer. Okay, that's what this is. So it's a trimer of a trimer and uh, there is a magenta, a magenta layer and then there is a, a bluish cyan layer on top. Uh, now uh, what happens is for doing the reaction, you can see that uh, that it has to work like a dimer. Although it's a trimer of a trimer, two of proteins come together because you could see the active site is made from, uh, this is the ligand that uh, is going to get base shuffled from both the active sites. So there is a cleft and then there is another, uh, uh, the, the, the lip of the cleft is made from the other subunit. So it requires two uh, uh, subunits for it to function. So as it is only functional as a dimer. So it was proposed the way things happen is that there's an active site glutamic acid which attacks uh, this C1 and then adenine uh, leaves. And uh, in the meantime, uh, this performs a covalent bond with the enzyme and then uh, the next base comes like guanine in this case and we will have the shuffling happen. So this is how an adenine is replaced by a guanine. We wanted to see if we can capture some of these intermediates in a photograph, like uh, photography at the atomic level is our topic, by using uh, crystallography. So what we did was we, we took protein and we added these ligands to it. For example, we added adenine, uh, adenosine to it and see how it fits in the active site. To tell how a particular thing fits in active site, again, we need electron density. If you have electron density, that means the ligand is there. And that's how we gauge anything is there or not. Uh, you should be able to see electron density. So we are able to see the electron density where in which we can now fit the ligand. You can see this is the ribose part with deoxy uh, being here and the one OH being here. And this is the five prime OH and the sugar has a pucker to it. It's a five membered sugar. And the flat part is our purine ring. And in this case, it's uh, adenosine. So you can see each and every atom is very clear. Now, by doing this complex structure of the protein with the ligand, we can see how the ligand is fitting into the protein. And you can see uh, this is uh, our glutamic acid that we think will, uh, will attack C1. And it has uh, near a tyrosine and an aspar uh, aspargine, which then stabilizes our purine ring. And there is a five prime anchor over here with a serine and aspargine over here. And, uh, and then there is uh, this hash thing, which is coming from the lip, from the second subunit, uh, that yellow thing that I was showing you there. And this, uh, uh, this is uh, capping the active site uh, uh, from the other side. So this is what the active site looks like. And this is showing you how the ligand fits in the active site, the molecular level interactions. Uh, and so you can see a mix of hydrophobic and hydro hydrogen bonding interactions govern the catalysis. So now uh, what uh, we are trying to do, we think that the glutamic acid will go and uh, attack at this position. There will be a carbocation type intermediate and uh, there will be uh, then uh, the bond breaking will happen. And uh, so some positive charge will be on this ring and, uh, and uh, the negative charge will be sta stabilized by the neighboring amino acid tyrosine backbone. And ultimately you will have a complex uh, which will be an ester intermediate, right, to select it. So can we uh, tell anything? Uh, we were able to show how this binds properly. Can we do more? So what we did was we wanted to slow down the reaction. To do that, we added a, a fluorine over here. Because what that happens is once slowly the reaction happens, it destabilizes this positive charged intermediate and the back reaction is even more slower. So the whole reaction scale, we have stretched it 
instead of happening in a matter of uh, milliseconds, now it will happen in a matter of hours and the back reaction will just not happen. So, uh, by doing um, this substitution of putting an electronegative atom at this position, we have slowed down the entire reaction. So, with this, uh, we, we actually decided uh, to prove our point by solving the structure. So, you can see again, again here, uh, this is the structure solved. And if you see here, this is the ribosylated intermediate. The, the ring has already broken and gone. And we can see that it is covalently bound to the glutamic acid. So, this is a glutamic acid. And indeed, the mechanism is true. This is a ribose sugar and it is covalently attached to this glutamic, so we, glutamic acid. So we were able to prove that whatever we draw in chem draw is actually true. It is not just a drawing. We can see it in our structures. So we were able to see this state and this um, state. Then we are able to see this ribosylated intermediate state, which we have tracked by using some ingenuity by slowing down the reaction. And here you can see this is the fluorine molecule. This is our OH, uh, 5 prime OH, and this is our OH, uh, the 2 prime OH. And you can see that now we are able to get the sugar only. And the reaction, the intermediate is trucked. So if we were to think about it, how it happens, you can see uh, uh, between the structures uh, before the reaction and after the intermediate is formed, this whole ribose ring moves closer. This glutamic acid rotates. You can see uh, before and after, and it is able to then attach itself to the C1 uh, carbon of the sugar. And uh, you see this is happening. So you can see uh, at a molecular level how the sugar uh, looks in two different orientation. And this is the fluorine that we are showing here. So we can look at the conformational changes that are happening in the course of the reaction as we uh, we go from the, uh, the, the reactant to the intermediate stage. And that we have been able to trap using crystallography. So here, how the reaction happens, we are able to trap using crystal structures. You can combine this knowledge uh, of what you have with uh, um, mutagenesis and en enzyme activity. And you can say that if you get rid of this 101, you almost have no activity because the attacking um, nucleophile is gone. And again, if you don't anchor any part, uh, uh, you can see that uh, when this is not there, so that the, the anchor point on this part is not there, activity is reduced. And again, D975, which is actually uh, helping in stabilizing the uh, purine ring, is also very important for activity. So you can see that you can do a structure uh, uh, mutagenesis activity uh, based analysis and get more information of the catalytic mechanism and the importance and confirmation of these things that you've got for crystallography. So the next question we said is why it is only specific for deoxy. If you add an OH group here, what happens? So we solved a structure with this uh, compound called 6 selenio inosine, which has OH over here also. Okay. And when we did that, we saw that if you have two OHs, then this attacking nucleophile here, which goes to C1, is hydrogen bonded and no longer the reaction can take place. So why only uh, deoxy? Because we don't want an OH here, which can then hydrogen bond and block our glutamic acid 101 and no attack can happen. Okay, so this is uh, uh, was another structure which helped us understand why deoxy. So structural knowledge was key. Then what we did was we wanted to know how we can, uh, like I said, make N3 or N7 ribosylation reactions because the type of uh, intermediates that you get from this type of things, the products, sorry, these products are very useful for developing anti-cancer and antiviral compounds because sometimes doing exact reactions like this is very difficult. But in this particular case, we saw apart from the position that is, uh, uh, is the desired position, uh, you can have other kinds of N3 linkages and N7 linkages instead of just the uh, N1 linkage that we want. So to see why that happens, we uh, we look, we solved structures and we were able to show how the same base can orient in N9 position, in N7 position, in N3 position, and you can get uh, different kinds of substrates uh, actually happening and uh, all the reactions being possible. And that is one of the reasons that um, you are able to get all this uh, different different reactions so the base has to just come closer and click and then uh, and then attack uh, uh, will happen and it will uh, all work out if you have uh, the, the right distance and in the active site the bases can arrange in different different ways so that makes it a promiscuous enzyme towards the second reaction and you can make side products which sometimes can be 
useful. Okay, uh, so uh, so this is the same thing, just showing you how the bases can be arranged in different ways. And if the bases are arranged in different ways, whichever nitrogen comes close is the uh, nitrogen which then um, attack, uh, attacks the uh, the intermediate, and you have the react the product which is different. Just showing you the orientation of the base in different three different orientations in three different compounds. So uh, uh, we are able to show that you can make N7 and N3 substituted compounds, and those can be useful. And in short, in summary, in this particular work, we were able to show how using crystallography, we can use the protein structure along with complexes uh, of various intermediates or the reactants and the products or inhibitors. And together, we can explain the stereochemistry, the reaction mechanism, and uh, why certain uh, reactions take place the way they, uh, they occur, how an enzyme can become be promiscuous and yet function, you can get functionalization reactions. And with this, I want to um, uh, tell you that uh, uh, using this as a uh, is a um, uh, as a benchmark, I've been able to show you how important crystallography uh, is in answering basic questions of the reaction mechanism and how protein structure is very important to understand what's going on uh, in various reactions inside our body and in the, and uh, how catalysis is happening. Yeah, so thank you for your uh, attention and it was really nice uh, giving this series. I again want to thank the organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity uh, to uh, 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 to uh, uh, give you uh, this uh, uh, lecture series and I hope you gained uh, from this uh, lecture series. Uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, email me at ruchi at chem.iitb.ac.in. I'll be happy to answer. And I hope I was able to excite you in the field of crystallography. And that's just why really my uh, goal here and show you how useful it is uh, and why uh, because uh, you are getting so many Nobel Prizes because so much molecular level, mechanistic level information is coming out of crystallography. With that, I'm going to uh, stop this recording and thank you all for your attention.